Welcome to Life, Laughter, Divorce, episode 52. I am your host, Leanne Linsky. And I'm the boyfriend. And we are here at 52 episodes. That is the completion of 52 weeks, which is? A year. Wow. Longer than most of our relationships. (laughs) (laughs) And we're still here together, you guys. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) (laughs) And sad all at the same time. But welcome back for another wonderful week of divorce. And we hope to see you again next week where we have another wonderful year coming our way. And while you're in there tuning in, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe. Unless, of course, you're in your car. And that is my PSA. I'm just going to make Every that. Every week. I'm going to make it a recording. And that's what it is. But and you know it, what? I, 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 I voice text in my car. Most people can voice text in their car Yeah, now. not me. Oh, that's right. Because you, you have are, the. I'm technically challenged, which I want to talk about today, by the way. <laughs> what I do want to talk about. So don't go away from that. But while you're tuning in, rate, review, and subscribe. If you want to send us a message, check out our uh, email, info at lifelafter divorce.com or our website if you're into a little uh checking out what's on uh, what's on the web go to lifelafterdivorce.com so yes speaking of technology boyfriend uh smarty pants no, I, I, was not... only, I was only gonna question your car and then i decided so, i better not better, right better not better say not. anything about okay the car. so <laughs> don't say anything about the baby So here's the deal. The boyfriend, as you guys know, is not on social media anywhere, cannot be found. He does not have an internet or uh, what's the the footprint? A digital footprint. He does not. I do not have a part. He does not have a digital footprint. Under under my real name, (laughs) I do not have any social media. But we did put it out to you guys if I should have a social media page as the boyfriend. And nobody responded. So I take that as a no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or you're all driving. So whatever, whatever. Now me on the other hand, no, okay. Yet yeah, no, okay. So he's not on social media. He has no digital footprint, but he's very techy. He is very techy. Like he does all the sound engineering on the pod. He does all kinds of other stuff. He's very savvy <laughs> with the phone and all that kind of cool stuff, right? Me on the other hand, I just want to like chuck the laptop into traffic most days if, you know, my browser needs updating. But I think I'm doing fairly well on the social media aspect of it. You know, we have our social media going out pretty regularly. I am familiar with Snapchat and all this whatnot. But then, all right, I'm going to admit, talking to today's guest, there are a few things that I was quite surprised at because I really didn't know about, uh, I don't know if you guys out there have heard about these vent rooms or confessionals, right? Right. So I took note. You'll hear me take note during the interview that I did later in the pod. But uh, I I have to report back. Now, no spoiler alerts. I'm not spoiling this, but vent rooms and confessionals. So first of all, I want you to know I went into Google and I put in my search vent rooms and it came up with air conditioners and ways to wire my HVAC system in my house. Clearly, that's not what we were talking about. So I tried it again and I put in confessionals thinking, Okay, maybe some apps will come up, but no, it was about the the church. Finally, <laughs> I uh, I conformed my Google search and I figured out, you guys, confessionals and chat rooms. Uh, there are places similar to like a Facebook or something like that where, if as long as you're over the age of thirteen, I think it is on this particular one I came up, and it's mutter dot com m u t t r dot com, and this is where. Kids and teens specifically, maybe even people in their early 20s, I don't know, and maybe some adults. Don't know. But if you go to mutter.com, this is the one I found. I don't know much about it. Uh, Basically, you can go in here anonymously or with some sort of uh, fake name, the boyfriend, and you can put in whatever it is you want to vent about, whatever it is that you want to confess about or talk about, or maybe you don't feel comfortable talking to people and you just got to put it out there somewhere into the universe and get it off your chest. These things are happening online. I had no idea. And neither did I. And I and we're a little older. And Mm-mm. and <laughs> <laughs> when we were growing up, we didn't have these sort of no. things. And we weren't inundated by all the information that the kids are today either. Right. And when we had to go out and actually make friends, we actually had to talk to them. So yeah. now nowadays... They, That's not happening. There's a loss of human connection, a loss of 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 having 
I don't know. I'm not that young person anymore, but I could imagine that if you don't have a personal connection with somebody, it may be harder to, to have a deep conversation with them. So how do you get, how do you, how are you, how do you unload those things? How do you communicate? How do you communicate? Yeah. yeah. How do you get that off your chest? How do you, I mean, it's gotta be pretty isolating. And I, because we didn't live in this age of technology I would, it's never even crossed my mind. And especially since we don't, we we live live in it, it, but we don't have kids growing up with it. So therefore we're not experiencing it in the same way that a teenager would, or, you know, a pre-adolescent. So, you know, going back to our typical topic of divorce, you know, and talking about kids and their experience, things have changed because technology and the world has evolved. And all of these things are so different from where we came from. And from one generation to another, it's just, uh, not quite the same, but the same. And I really enjoyed talking today's to today's guest because she shed some really bright light on these areas of where the connections are the same and where they're different and how we can find them and, and how what we can do to educate their, ourselves on them. And I, I found it just just really super helpful and kind of a little mind blowing at times. But I think what she's doing is absolutely incredible. And I truly enjoyed talking to her. And boyfriend, I, I, if you're thinking of getting social media platforms, she's probably the person to go to <laughs> if you <laughs> want to see what's happening and what's new. But besides social media, I mean, we talked about so, so, so much more in the relationships with kids and specifically teenagers. And this week, the guest I am talking about, her name is Julie Smith. She's a licensed psychotherapist award-winning author and featured TEDx speaker. She is an expert in the study of human behavior, specifically adolescent behavior. She has created pioneering workshops and courses such as What to Do When and Speak Teen to help parents and professionals connect with teens while also dispelling the myth of adolescent, quote, misbehavior. So Julie is a single parent, not only works with kids, but she lives with three of her very own teens. So without further ado, meet Miss Julie Smith. Julie, welcome to Life Laughter Divorce Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're very, very, very welcome. And today you are calling in from another state. (laughs) I am. And oddly enough, I might be in one of the warmer places. I am calling in from Boulder, Colorado. Ah, It was 60. Really? It was in the 60s today. Yeah, everybody else is freezing, but it's nice and warm here. How awesome. We are really lucky because it's been warm in California. (laughs) So I'm so glad and I'm so sorry to everybody else who's getting some terrible snow and freezing weather so you know get smart move out here right <laughs> exactly <laughs> call it on california and you'll follow the seas that's right <laughs> that's right so i'm really excited to have you because you have a lot of experience um that i'm sure some of our other listeners have had as well but maybe not to your degree and we most certainly haven't discussed it um to the degree that we're going to today And so that I'm very excited. Um, So one of those things is going to be teens, obviously. But, uh, you know, just for our listeners sake, to give them a little bit of background on you, um, you've been divorced twice. I have. And from what you tell me, you kind of have an interesting story about that. Well, the first one, I call it my starter marriage. I was young. (laughs) And I remember going to, I remember going to my wedding and my dad said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, no, but I already mailed out the invitations. Everybody's there. So I, we got married and I think for both of us, we knew it wasn't right. Um, And the breaking point at that one was the day I said, if, if the dishes didn't get done, I would throw them all away. And I threw the dishes away the next day. Uh, (laughs) Did you really? I really did. (laughs) So it wasn't my finest moment. And I share that because we all have those moments where we're not, we're not top notch. And that was one of mine. And yeah, it was, it was about a year 
and we parted ways and actually we haven't, that was, oh my goodness. That was in the mid nineties. So it was a while ago. I mean, I'm dating myself now. (laughs) No, Um, you're not. I'm right there with you. (laughs) Oh, good. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, It's sisterhood there. Sisterhood of us getting, we'll we'll pretend we're not getting older. No, we're Um, not. We're not. We're just living our life backwards. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. Ah, uh, I love that. And, you know, with my first marriage, it was also, we'll call it curious. Um, I met him because my brother married one of the sisters. Oh. So it really, it became this marriage of convenience. And I learned a lot in that year. I learned a lot about myself. I was young, you know, I was 25. And I met my met the father of my children and shortly after I got divorced and we met at work we hit it off and we were married for 12 years and one day we just we realized we started growing apart and we talked about separation we talked about what we needed to do and we were writing a grocery list and I looked at him and I said do you think maybe we should just separate and end it. He's like, yeah, let's do that. It was one of those things that felt very natural. And there wasn't, there was, there weren't a lot of, you know, those feelings of hardship or anger. We just, it really unfolded at that point. There weren't, um, we became, we became friends and we still lived together. We, we called it like our nest. We, we stayed in the same house for a while, even after we split. And then that's when I think it started getting challenging. But now we've been apart. I can't believe it. This year will be seven years. We were talking about that the other day. We still talk almost every day. We hang out. He was here for Christmas. We watch Die Hard together because that is the ultimate holiday movie. Um, and people ask me about that because they don't understand how we can get along when we got divorced. And I think divorce was probably the best thing for us to get along. And it was the best thing for our kids. Really? Yeah. That is, that's pretty cool that I always am amazed when, when couples can have such a good solid friendship after the divorce. It's, I I think for me, I felt, free to say what I wanted to say. Like I never felt like I had to, when we were married, I always, you know, I wanted to make sure he was happy and I wanted to be happy, but I would hold back on things that I wanted to say, you know, just to keep the peace. Once we were apart, I didn't hold back. And because of that, I think we developed a new respect for one another. And don't get me wrong. It's not, you know, rainbows and unicorns. We still, we fight about things with the kids. We, I think it drives him nuts because, you know, I end up when he dates someone, I end up being friends with them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be, yeah, I could see. I, be I'm really trying to give like some space. So I'm really trying to develop a boundary around that, but it, they're so fun. They, I really like hey, he has really good taste, right? He has great taste. They, you know, I always say, gosh, if you weren't dating them, they'd be my best friend. I'd hang out with them all the time. He's like, Stop. You're not allowed <laughs> around any of them. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Wow. No. Okay. So do you think in some ways that you do that on purpose? Oh, of course. Really? Uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of me that I call it poking the bear that finds poking the bear fun. Um, <laughs> because I know it really gets under his skin. And It's not my finest moment. Again, I have a few of those that pop up from time to time. He's aware of it. Really? And I'm aware of it. Are the other women aware of it? I don't, I have no idea. They don't stick around long enough to find out. (laughs) One did, and we've become really close friends. Um, But no, I don't think she saw it as me. Well, she might have saw me maybe poking the bear a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's funny though. I I can appreciate that. I could I could totally appreciate that. And I often wonder because I I do hear from people that can have that kind of a friendship, and I'm like, really? Like, isn't there ever like 
I've just always wondered about that because with my ex-husbands in the 90s, I mean, I haven't seen them since that decade. So I don't, I don't, because we didn't have any children together. So there was no reason for us to keep that connection. You know, that, that's, I think the difference also is we have these three amazing humans that give us a lot of incentive to try to, to get along. If the kids weren't in the picture, I don't think we would be, we would still be part of each other's life in some way. I'm sure maybe Facebook friends, Mm -hmm. but we wouldn't be working towards having this friendly relationship. Yeah. Well, let's talk about those kids. They're teenagers, right? Yeah, I have three of them. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I love teenagers, but I, I also know that I probably am a teenager at heart in many ways. Um. I definitely eat like one, which is probably not the best thing. (laughs) (laughs) Or it's exactly the best thing. Um, So, so what, how old were your kids when, when you went through your divorce? Oh, okay. My son, who's my oldest, he will be 18 this year. When we first separated, he was 11 and Mm. then, you know, went through all of it and, you know, I think by the time we divorced, he was probably 13, 12 or 13. Uh, my daughters would have been 10 and 8. So, yeah, 8, 10 and 11 when we separated and then divorced. Yeah, right before they went into those teen years. Right before. Ah, okay. So I know, okay, so your background in, in and with teens and being a psychotherapist and mm-hmm. having this... Um, experience and all of your knowledge with a teen experience did you have all of this prior to your divorce or is this something that you gained after it's a mix I've worked with families in some capacity even when I was a teenager myself so I've always had kind of a foot or a hand in the field of human behavior and human development my whole life I had not taken it to the level that I'm at now before I got divorced. I was starting to, I ran programs for younger children, but it was, you know, it was all younger children. It wasn't around teenagers. And one of the things that happened after the divorce was I gave myself permission to really follow my passion. And I love working with teens. I think that they are incredible souls and they, they're this blank canvas, just ready to, fill with paint, uh, they, all these beautiful paint, these beautiful colors of how they see the world. Uh, and they're just, they're fantastic. Yeah. And so the divorce really gave me permission or I gave myself permission after the divorce to follow that. So, so when you were going through this and your divorce and you had your kids just getting ready to enter those teenage years, how, how did you look at it from a, a personal point of view differently from your professional point of view? What changed? That's a great question. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that changed is that above all else, I knew that there, all the relationships in my life were evolving. So there was this evolution of the relationship with my with my kids, but there was also an evolution of the relationship with myself and, you know, with my ex and with, with my business, everything. And the more I realized that I needed to evolve things, the more I realized that I needed to set up boundaries, but the boundaries didn't mean that they were separate, that my life, my, my personal life and my work life were so separate. It was, I can't, I can't walk out at the end of the day and say, "Eh, I'm done. There's, they still blend together, but I have boundaries around what isn't, isn't okay. um, In terms of how much my kids are part of my work life and how much, you know, I live in a town where there's a lot of crossover uh, in terms of when you have teens and you work with teens. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very aware of that. And I've always been incredibly open and honest with my kids and said, what is and isn't okay. And I think that's what I did the most is I said, what works for you guys? This is what works for me. What works for you? Right. Well, working with teens and everything and, and knowing that yours are not the only one who went through divorce. 
when when you see so many from your own experience, from other people's experience, would you say that divorce will really screw up your kids? No. I, you know, the thing that's, whether it's kids, whether it's adults, the thing that screws us up isn't the act of a divorce or the whatever, you know, whatever is happening. It's not that specific thing. It's how we react to that. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I was really aware of, and even when we told our kids, we, we sat down and we said, we may not be a husband and wife, but we are still mom and dad and we still are a family. And we did our best to respond in ways that made them feel safe. And because of that, they, are, they're, they have this sense of self of I'm an individual, but I can also rely on my family. Sometimes they have that sense of self so strong. I'm like, can we just go back to when you're little? And <laughs> maybe I should have, you know, reacted to, to mess you up a little bit. So you need me more. But, you know, yeah. there, it, it gave them belief in themselves that and it gave them the ability to develop the relationship with each of us in a way that I don't think they could have had if we had stayed together. Because before we operated as this, uh, it was almost like we were a parental unit. And sure, there's mom and there's dad, but in very many ways, we were this one parent unit. And so the kids related to us in one way. Now they have a relationship with me in a way that works for them. And they have a relationship with their dad in a way that works for, for them. Yeah. What about other families? How do you feel you compared to other families? Because you obviously had some experience under your belt and seeing this with other people and able to do better maybe with your own family. And what ways do you think you see other people struggle with this? I mean, obviously it's in the way they react, but what are some of those examples? Well, I think we all look at, you know, we all have a different experience and our, the way that we move through a divorce is based on our own experiences and our own lens of life. And I think that's where people struggle. Uh, I don't think there's anybody who might be, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to say, oh, I'm, I'm crushing it. And this is great. We've got it down. We don't. I mean, we have problems just like anybody else and how we figure things out. Um, you know, our parenting styles are very different. And I think for other people where I see struggles come up is they, they look at their, they're responding and react, or they're actually reacting to their own trauma and their own history, their resentment, their, um, their rejection, and they're fighting with that. And, and when you, when you hold on to these feelings of, I want to be right, or I have to be justified, I have to be validated in my anger. That's when you have the struggles, whether it's with your ex, whether it's with your kids, kids will pick up on, on what's going on. Um, you know, an example is let's say that there's a family and the mom and dad cannot get along. It's very contentious. They cannot say anything to each other without it being, you know, screw you. I hate you. I'm going to take you to court. If that just stays between the parents and the child never picks up on it, the child never has that experience. So they're okay. They're okay with their parents being divorced. And, but the struggle for a lot of families is they, it doesn't stay between just the mom mm -hmm. and the dad when it gets right. divorced. They pull the kids in because they want the kids to validate the anger. Right. Or it, yes, yes, I can completely see what you're saying. Right. Well, how do you, so, so obviously the kids, you can't keep them isolated from everything that's happening. So when a divorce is happening, how do you actually go about telling your kids that this is, this is where you're at? I, I think the first thing is I love, um, there's a saying, kiss. It's like, keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. Um, you don't need to go into any big explanation. Kids already know something's going on, especially teenagers. Yeah. And if you tell them too much, one, they're going to check out. And if you skirt around the issue, they're going to call B 
BS. They're going to know that you're <laughs> not telling them enough because their bullshit radar is so on point. So when you're telling, you know, and specifically with teens is just be honest and say, you know, things aren't working out. Um, and, and really, it's that saying of we're still a mom, we're still a dad, but we are not going to be a husband and a wife. And then asking them, what do you need to feel supported? And they might not tell you that first time, but the second, the third time you ask, hey, what do you need from us? They'll tell you. They might say, I really don't want dad hanging out here. If you guys are divorced, be divorced. Or I don't want to hear how much you hate mom. But they'll tell you. Mm. And then and then listen to that and let yeah. that be your guide. Yeah. Good point. Just ask them, right? <laughs> yeah. It's asking someone what they want or what they need is the most powerful thing we can do. Nobody does it. Like it, I forget to do it. And I, when I do ask someone or when I ask my kids and they tell me, I'm like, wow, that was so easy. I have, yeah. I have to do that more. <laughs> Yeah. And you, I always think about that. It's like, well, I always assumed that you wanted what I wanted. And it's usually never the case. That's, that's a big one right there. Assumptions are made. And, you know, we were talking a minute ago about struggles. That's mm -hmm. where people struggle also is they make assumptions. Yeah. Or we think that people behave the same way we would behave or want the same things we want. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not true. Everybody's different. Yeah. I think that's really a good point of keeping it simple because I think anytime we have to tell bad news, we have a tendency to this inclination just to spill our guts and over explain and over share mm -hmm. information. And that puts probably teenagers in a very awkward spot. It does. Teenagers don't want to hear that many words. You know, <laughs> if you just say, hey, we're getting divorced and throw in a shrug, they'd probably be like, right on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, it's, and part of this is the way their brain works. And yeah. they're, they have so much information coming in. And the other part of this, they're, they're developmentally supposed to be selfish. So they don't necessarily want to hear all about mom and dad's problems because they, they're dealing with their own right. you know, friend stuff. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's probably bigger things happening in their world than we think. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what about the parents that um, avoid doing the breakup, but avoid the divorce for a while because they think it's best for their kids, especially if they're a teenager? You know, I hear that so often. People say, oh, we stayed together for the kids. kids know exactly what's going on. Even if they, they might not be able to say, oh, you know, dad's saying this to mom or mom's saying this to dad. They know something's up. They know if their parents aren't getting along and staying together because you think it's best for the kids is often doing more harm for the kids because when they know something isn't right, they take it as they're doing something wrong. Mm. And so it'll increase their anxiety and they might pull away even further from you and feel like, Oh, you know what? My parents, they're never happy. I'm, I must be doing something wrong. You know what? I'll just hang out with my friends more and be where it feels safer. Right. Right. It amazes me. I have, I have friends who are together and they, you know, husbands and wives and they're completely miserable. It's obvious. And I, I don't even live with them. But they, it, it, it cracks me up every time I, I hear these people and they're like, oh, my kids have no idea that we're this miserable. And I'm like, I know you're this miserable and I, <laughs> I don't even see you that often, you know. Um, so kids, kids are smart. They are so smart. They can read a situation. They know what's going on. And if they're, if they don't, if they say they don't or they're acting like they don't, they, they don't. Um, they're doing it to hide. They're hiding those feelings because they're so worried that they're part of the problem. Mm. Right. So when, when you address it with kids, when you're going through divorce and you're keeping it simple, is there any place in there where it needs to be made clear that it's not their fault or is there a way to do this? So it doesn't sound cliche. Well, it's going to sound cliche. Uh, <laughs> is it? Okay. It, it, it really, yeah. It's probably just going to sound cliche. But, I, you know, it, it, 
it really is saying, this isn't about you. This isn't about you know, your sister, your brother. It's about us. And you can say, it sounds cliche. And, it, and you might think that you know, we're blowing smoke. I get it. We all have to work through this and figure it out. But I'm telling you that, you know, from my heart, this has nothing to do with you. Um, if, you know, we can answer some questions if you, you know, that you want to know about, but we also are going to keep some of this to ourselves because there's some things that we need to deal with as grownups that you don't be part of, but because you're not part of that doesn't mean that it's because of you or that it's your fault. Right. So do you put all of this in a text with some emojis? <laughs> yeah. You know what? No, I think the most effective way is to Snapchat it. Oh, <laughs> Put no. it on your Snapchat story. <laughs> and change your voice. Yes. <laughs> yes. And make sure that you add um, the cat ears or the puppy face when you're doing it. <laughs> that will really make it an impactful moment for your child. And then stick out your tongue and throw up a rainbow. <laughs> yes. Please. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. We're speaking their language. And speaking of speaking their language, you do a whole thing on teen speak. I do. Teens have their own language. And to be part of their culture, it's just like if you were to go, let's say you go, you know, I don't know. Let's let's say you throw somebody in Mexico and they they don't know the language. They don't know Spanish. They don't know... Um, they don't know, you know, the culture, they don't know anything, they're going to feel lost. You know, it doesn't matter where somebody goes, if they go to a foreign land, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they don't know the traditions, they will feel completely confused, and they'll feel shut out. The same is true with teens. If you don't know their language, their culture, their traditions, their kind of their social norms, you're going to be shut out. And so what I do is I help people learn the language. I help them understand the culture. And the first way we do that is by simply remembering what it was like for grownups like you and me, remembering what it's like to be a teenager. Mm. Yeah. And that's probably one of the simplest things that we as adults, whether we are parents or not, is to remember what it was like to be a teenager. Because then when we encounter them, whether it's walking down the street or whether it's, you know, in your living room, you view them differently. You start to see them as these incredible people rather than, oh, God, they're teenagers. They're rude. They're, <laughs> you know, they're that. And that's what I hear all the time. First thing people will say when yeah. I say, I work with teens, they're like, oh, God, they're such a pain in the ass. I'm like, really? Because <laughs> I was thinking that when I sat on that tack, that was a pain. But kids, yeah. oh, no, they're kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really the first step to learning how to speak teen is to remembering what it was like to be one. Yeah, and that's scary. Just yeah. re- right, remembering when we were teenagers. And but a lot has changed, right? So even though we can put ourselves back into that space of that awkwardness and thinking like, oh, we're we're getting so much older and we're adults and we're so close and, you know, all those different things we go through as teenagers and thinking we know everything and yet feeling we don't know anything. A lot has changed like with technology and and things that didn't exist then exist now. And they're, I feel like they're facing challenges we would never have even considered. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it is interesting because the environment and the intensity that kids are facing things is so different than when you know, we were growing up. But the core emotions and actually the type of issues, like when you, get, when you break it down to what's at the core of the issues, are the same. So if you if you take the feelings, we, you know, for me, I would feel, I might feel sad or I would feel anxious about something. I'd be scared. I'd be rebellious. You know, all those, those emotions don't change. And, you know, in high school, there was always somebody who, you know, there was always a party. So we we're still faced with, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, um, bullying, fighting with your parents. So those type of things are the same. Now though, it's the it's the intensity of it and the environment that it's offered. So bowling doesn't just look like somebody, you know, pushing you in the hallway. Bowling looks like somebody, you know, sending you text or um, 
you know, posting on Facebook something about, well, actually teens don't even use Facebook anymore. They use Instagram. So they might post Instagram and they might create a fake account, um, a Finsta, they call it a Finstagram. Um, what do they call it? it? A Finstagram, a fake Instagram, Finstagram. Oh, all right. I'm writing that down because I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. So it, it looks different. The feelings are the same. The core of the issues are the same, but the intensity is so different. And that's the other piece of learning to speak teen is understanding the culture. That's, you know, you've got to understand what are, where are they? They're on Snapchat. They're on Instagram. Um, they might be on confessional sites. What are they watching? Kids don't watch TV shows as much. So what are confessional do. sites? Oh, there's confessional apps. So there's one called Vent. And you can just vent either anonymously or you might have your own friend group and you can vent about anything. There's apps where people will say, oh, I have a crush on Johnny. He's so hot. Typically, it'll be, you know, they might confess other things as well. So there's a whole, it's a whole nother market. Mm. And at YouTube, kids are influenced by YouTube, not TV or movies as much. In fact, nice. they are influenced more by YouTube's. Um, YouTube stars, then they would be um, a celebrity or, you know, somebody who's starring in a movie or something like that. That is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about what you can see on YouTube, like, really? Um, and yeah, that's so different from where I grew up or what was happening. I mean, everything's happening at such a more rapid pace. They're evolving at such a more rapid pace than, um, than they were back then it seems and so when parents are going through through a divorce and things what are some of these new things that are happening like in the technology world or i guess does that even matter does that make it, any sense it does and it it does matter but it doesn't matter necessarily because someone's going through a divorce okay. it matters because you have teenagers Okay. That's why it matters. Yeah. What I will say when, whether you're going through a divorce or not, I think technology is a way to keep connected. So if you, you know, mom and dad are in separate houses, you know, a text here and there from dad throughout the week when they're not seeing them goes a long way to feel connected. Right. Or, you know, um, seeing an Instagram post of maybe your pet that's at your mom's house, you know, can go a long way. Right. Okay. So what about, uh, <laughs> here's a weird question that just popped into my mind. I, these confessional sites, I'm kind of, uh, kind of obsessed with this idea. These, <laughs> I can only imagine. So these, these confessional sites are these places where, um, people who go, who are single parents, maybe be cautious of using these things on your own, knowing maybe your kids are going to see them. Yes, and most of it's anonymous. Um, okay. I would say the average age on these confessional sites is 12 to 21. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, all right, well. So you might, well, and here's, here's what a, a great thing to do. When, when you are going through a divorce and you're feeling like, I don't know what to, you know, I don't know what to talk to my kid about or I'm worried about them. Empower your kid to teach you something. Say, all right, mm. I'm kind of lame on the whole tech thing. So can you show me how to set up Spotify, some Spotify playlists? Or can you give me some YouTubers that you might think I might know so I can talk to you more? And they will help you. Teens will help you with that if you ask them and you don't judge it. If, as long as you're not saying... Well, I'm going to set this up so I can spy on you. <laughs> oh, you know, right. That's different. Yeah. But if you just say, help me, because I, I want to learn some new things. So just teach me a few things. They'll teach you. Now, the confessional sites, they might not because they want to keep those secret. Ah, uh -huh, OK. So it's just good to know about. It's good to know about it. OK. And then it might be good to, like you say, I just uh, taught my parents how to text. So, um, yes, I know. Um, but I did, and that was really fun. That ended up being a fun event. So yeah, I could see where that would be helpful. And, and they know a lot more of the newer things that are coming out. So it's a good way to keep the communication lines flowing, I would think. 
Absolutely. My son and I just created this tutorial on on Snapchat for grownups because so many grownups want to know what Snapchat is. And it was, I learned, and I'm on Snapchat a lot, which is ridiculous, but I'm <laughs> on there a lot. And I learned something. He was so excited. He's like, you mean I get to teach people? It's like, I'm only going to teach you what I want you guys to know. I'm like, excellent. That's the whole point. <laughs> and so kids want to be asked and they want to help. So, yeah. you know, when, when there's a change in the family dynamic, bring the kids in rather than saying, oh, I'm going to deal with everything on my own. Have them ask them what they can, what they want to help out with or right. what they could teach you. Okay. No, that's, those are great suggestions, especially around technology, because I'm, that's why I'm thinking there has to be some way to bridge that gap on what, what generation, you know, there's differences. So mm -hmm. that's a fantastic idea, you know, and, and about including them in things as things change. What about when dating happens? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> That can go down two different ways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Only two? <laughs> well, I'll cry really? more, but we're going to say it's either a yes or a no okay. when it comes to teens. So, <laughs> uh, Teens want to know, but they don't want to know too much. Yeah. So I, I think it's fair. And I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm not going to address like with younger kids, but with teenagers, it's fair to say, what are your thoughts around me dating? just to hear their thoughts. Some might say, eh, I, you know, I kind of feel like maybe you should wait a little bit just for me. And you could say, you know, all right, well, I'd like to meet people. So if I'm meeting people, if I'm going out for coffee, do you want to know, or would you prefer you not know? That's a, that is fair to say. Um, they want to be a little bit part of what's going on, but they don't want to know, oh, I went out on this date with this guy or this girl. And man, we went and we went and danced all night. And then I don't know, I wasn't sure if he was going to kiss me. They don't want to know. The thought of a parent kissing <laughs> freaks them out. So they don't want to know any of that. Uh, but it's, it is fair to ask them what their thoughts are around you dating. If it's right. a hard no, and they're like, no, absolutely not. There needs to have, there needs to be some deeper conversations um, because your child's hurting. Yeah. Yeah. What about with double standards, like if you're dating and your teenagers are just starting to date and they're like, well, you do this, is it, it must be okay for me to do that. Yeah. So when it comes to teens dating, the first thing I always suggest is to ask your teen to tell you what dating is because ah. dating has a lot of different definitions for them. Sometimes it's, I'll hear middle school schoolers saying, oh, I'm dating so-and-so. I'm like, Oh, what does that look like? And like, oh, you know what? We talk in the hallway and we sit together at lunch. That might be a sixth grader. I might hear an eighth grader say I'm dating and they're actually going out on dates. Um, and then in high school, it's different. So you need to get their definition. Sixth Is graders date. go on date. Oh my God. I'm writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Kids know things very young. If you yeah. think that fourth graders don't know about sex and dating, um, it's time to have a conversation with them. Right. As they do, they hear it, they hide it. They hide that they know it because they don't want to scare their parents, mm -hmm. but they know so much by fourth grade. Really? Mm hmm. It's a uh, YouTube. It's, <laughs> it's, I'm blaming it's... It. it's YouTube and confessional sites. <laughs> I there you see. go. That's the root of all evil right there. <laughs> right. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to visit a confessional site so I can see what 12 graders, what do they have to vent about? That's what I'm curious about. Like, what are they venting about? Oh, oh my gosh. Um, they're venting about, they might vent about homework. They're venting about how a friend wronged them. They might vent that um, they didn't have the right food today. They might vent about how often their parents are being, they, anything. That's Everything. fascinating. Why aren't adults on here? There are so many things I need to vent about. Would it be I, weird for an adult to go on these confessionals and do a confessional? No, oh. I, I mean, I, I, I think that there are adults on there, but I think what we usually do is we call up our friends and we go out and have oh, right. a drink, drink and we, <laughs> we call it a bitch session. Okay, That's great. Okay. <laughs> 
trip to the so bar. You're, all, you're doing the low tech version. Right. But okay. That's what we do. Got it. <laughs> I, I think I prefer that. So my confessional is a trip to the bar with a friend. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. <laughs> okay. I'm, we, I am now getting a complete understanding here. This is awesome. This is awesome. See, I have no children, so I'm missing out on all of this fun. Uh, this is, <laughs> I love it. I'm loving this. So, so are there any things that I should or shouldn't be doing to support my teen mm. since, since I'm divorced? Like if I had a teen, what would those things look like? One of the things that I see that, that happens and it, it happens because it's like this perfect storm when a parent gets divorced and they have a teenager and they're also realizing that their teenager is growing up and doing their own things, they start to latch on and they lean on their, they lean on their teenager a little too much. They share too much looking to create a friendship and a bond because they don't have a spouse in the house anymore to talk to. So they share too much and that can be really overwhelming for a teenager. And you'll either get a, a kiddo who will sit and listen, but they're, they don't know what to do with it. And they're learning too much about the other parent or about this parent, or you'll get a kiddo who will just pull away completely and won't talk to a parent. So the oversharing, the over dependency, you know, you want to be cautious of that. The thing you, I think that you should do is look at this as an opportunity for both you and your teen to develop a sense of self. You know, in the beginning, I mentioned that the divorce gave me permission to follow my dreams. Look at this as permission for your teen to really step into their own and for you to step into your own and really permission for you guys to create the relationship that works for you, not based on anybody else's needs, but your own. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty pretty important thing to to consider because often it's quite common these days for our parents to want to be friends with their children mm -hmm. versus then be a parent and that's an entirely different relationship isn't it it is and it's a fine line uh the way you the way you parent your children when they're younger you know it people understand that you know you're telling your kiddo, go brush your teeth. Hey, let's do this. You feel like that parent. Like there's, it's a clear role of your parent. Your child is leaning on you. You tell them what to do because they're learning. Once they hit fifth grade, so around 11, they're needing you differently. And so the way you parent your child at 11 is going to be different than at 12 and at 13 and at 14 and at 15. <laughs> so it, you are going to evolve it I would say annually, but you're going to probably evolve it seasonally. It will change. And so there's this need to want to be friends with them because now you're thinking, oh, they're older. We're buddies. We're this. You can be friendly, but they really need a parent, especially during those middle school years. And especially if there's any the change in family dynamics, especially in those middle school years, they need a parent more than they need a friend. They have a lot of friends. In high school, it changes. So my oldest is a junior. I will say that we have, I call it collaborative parenting because he'll be 18 later this year. Mm -hmm. He'll be, you know, he'll be off in college in just a little over a year. It, we are a little more like friends at time. He knows that I'm, I still, you know, I could say, this is the rule. This is what's going on. But he also knows he could say, mom, are you, are you kidding me? Like, this is what I need. And we can talk about it. So we, it's more collaborative and mm -hmm. we are, we are friendlier and I can see the friendship starting to evolve, but I would not have had this relationship with him if I had been his friend at 13. Right. Right. What would you say are the big distinct differences in parenting versus friendship? So, Parenting, it, it's it's funny because when you know we think of friends, we think of buddy buddy. We're hanging out. I don't know if you're ever fully in that friend zone with your kids if you're a parent because you are always worried about them and you're looking out for them. You can't come to you can't come to them without an agenda in mind. 
<laughs> because you're like, I just want you to be safe. So you could be hanging out with, let's say I'm hanging out with my son and he could say, yeah, you know, mom, I'm, I'm really thinking that I want to join the police academy. My first thought would be, uh, no, I'm <laughs> telling you, you're not doing that. It, it, so something like that. So we're always going to try to lay down that parental law. So that's going to be the biggest difference. But I think the change as parents, what happens is the role evolves rather than being this hands-on provider, as you were when you were younger, you get to be more of a quiet observer and also sometimes an engaged participant in their life. And that can have a very friendly tone. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I'm just always curious because it's it's interesting. I, well, I don't have any kids. So I always find myself observing other people with kids and the different relationships that they have with them. You know, as like if, for instance, we're sitting at the same table and they turn to their their kids to have a conversation, it's um, it's from an outsider's point of view, there's like a, their own language. Whether the kid is at a certain age, there's a certain understanding, a certain tone, a certain energy shift when they're talking to their children versus anybody else, which mm -hmm. I get. That's family, right? But there's also like when kids are teenagers, especially, there's a different sort of, um, I'm not sure what the word is. There's like a, a certain kind of bond there at, at, at a point with parents and a teenager because their teenagers are difficult to talk to. So if I'm trying to talk to someone else's teenager, I mean, that's just weird because there's unless thus they think you're cool and they have something, you know, a conversation and some sort of connection there. Um, if, it's interesting to see how a parent can have open them up and have a totally different conversation or mm -hmm. the exact opposite. You know, where the 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 teen has a more comfortable talking to someone on the outside and then the uh, eye roll and the shrug and the uh, grunt when their parent talks to them. So right. it's, it's just kind of interesting to watch people at the different stages of lives with their with their children and how that that bond shifts and changes. And because I've never experienced that on my own, I'm like, oh, I don't even know how I would do that. Well, you, you, you actually said what that, what the difference is and what the, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You said they have their own language and that's what it is. It's learning the language of a teen. And as parents, you know, if, if you do have kids, you're going to learn the language a little bit differently. And sometimes we don't learn it because we're so worried about our own agenda. I got to keep you safe. I've got to, you know, protect you. And kids are like, stop, like, let me be me. Uh, I, I know that people probably look at me and my kids and it does look like we're friends. And for all intents and purposes, yes, we have an incredibly friendly relationship. We talk about everything and I am still the mom and my tone will change. And I, I, and I call it being mom. Like, Oh, I'm going to turn into like crazy mom. I'm going into mom mode. And they're like, Oh, <laughs> but it's because we've created our own language within a language. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you go out and you see people, you know, you might see a teenager talking to a complete stranger with ease, that person's speaking their language, is able to cue into what they're saying, the responses, and maybe a parent isn't, or vice versa. Maybe a parent is on point with what their kid's language is, but somebody else isn't. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's really that way with anything, because I mean, if you think about the people you, you know, you interact with, there's some you're going to open up with more and others you won't. Yeah. Well, what about, so I know you have these workshops and courses and speak teen, right? Mm -hmm. What is, what do you share with parents in this? What, what can they learn? I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of stuff, but <laughs> I don't, I don't question that for a minute, but I'm curious, are like, what are some of the key, key takeaways from that? And like, is this like a whole, like, is this about learning slang or is this about just learning to read your team? Oh, there is an element of it of learning. Kids don't speak in the way we, we think that they do. They, they speak in short sentences. They speak, you know, in acronyms. 
it's it's fascinating because if you look at the influence that teens have had in our in our world you know i know we keep talking about snapchat but it's fascinating because twitter and snapchat were made around an adolescent's mind Mm -hmm. because that's how they think they think in characters they think in snippets and look how it's influenced all of our lives right so you know we do talk about those type of that type of influence that they have we talk about you know their the, the language the words they're using but beyond that i think what's most important and the key takeaway is that teens are not problems they're not a, a treatment plan. They're not a bad grade. They're not, they're not any of those things. What they are, are people. People have problems, but people are not problems. Um, and that's the biggest takeaway is because when we, when we can see teenagers as who they are as a person, then we can address the things that they are being challenged with, whether it's anxiety or depression, um, whether it's you know, homework, we can look at all of those, those different things that are affecting and influencing them if we can see them as a person, a person first. And I really call that the myth of misbehavior because we were like, oh, that kiddo's misbehaving, they're a the problem. Really, it's, it's a signal that something's going on. And mm. so I help people learn to decipher those signals. And, with, it, and it helps, you know, whether, you know, it, it could be an educator who wants to figure out how to read those cues with their students or a parent who's looking to understand how to have a better relationship with their child or support their child. Or it could be, you know, like you had said that you don't have children. It could be you saying, I really want to understand, like I'm fascinated now by teenagers. I think they're influencing every single day of my life. Yeah. And they are. They are. (laughs) Well, just with all of the new and current things that are out, you think about it you know, anything from music and the onward. And it, it is fascinating. They're our future. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, you know, I love that they're our future and they're also our now um, because they are contributing to all of the, you know, the humanities to arts, to sciences at a level now that we've never seen before. Right. Yes. Yes. They're important. And I feel like oftentimes they're very overlooked. And as I sitting here and I'm taking all of this in and with what you're sharing with me, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, these are some of the most crucial years in our life. Like these change. These these years can change so much. Mm -hmm. So they're crucial. It is important to have to understand where they are, where they're coming from. You know? It is. And, and, you know, often we feel like, oh, we have to teach them so much. But when we can take a breath and pause and realize they can teach us just as much. Yeah. Yes. It's kind of when we see the new person in the room and it's like, oh, right. I used to be that person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. right. Right. It's always going back to the basics. Like, yes, it's. And I think you nailed it earlier in the conversation is when you said, you know, it's really, even though we have all of these other distractions and all this other technology, it comes down to the basics. We have the same human emotions Mm -hmm. and they're key and they're, they're so important to us at that age. And we kind of have to remember that and tap back into that and, and respect it because, um, I guess that's how we connect. That's goes back to the very core of us as our feelings. We are emotional beings and that our emotions aren't just in our head. They are through our whole body. And if we can go back and connect on that emotional level, that's where you're going to see the connections with one another. Right. Right. This is so helpful. I have so many notes written down and I have so many things that I'm going to be researching this week because of our conversation. This is, we'll be emailing each other about confessional sites and saying, oh, right? are you going to go on it? I, oh my gosh. I, I better I, I better be careful because now the people are going to be like, who's this creep on here? Um, what's happening? What are we? New site. Everybody leave. The old people are coming. <laughs> so. It's so true. If you look at the evolution of like social media. Yeah. Facebook is now seen as the place where, quote unquote, the old people hang out. 
Twitter is still okay, okay, but some kids are like, eh, Instagram, it's still popular. But even Snapchat, kids are like, oh, grownups are on all these things. We need something new. So <laughs> something new will come. That's all there's at least yeah. for a little while. <laughs> yes, it's so true. Everything evolves. Everything changes just as our relationships do. And and this has been so helpful. And I love that all, all the things that you're doing, um, that you have these workshops available so that other people, if as they listen to this and they're like, I need more of this, I need help with these things, all of your contact information is going to be in the show notes um, so people can reach out to you and ask some questions, uh, find out um, how they can find your TEDx talk, all of that good stuff. Um, because this is... Uh, Teenagers are everywhere. People need to know. <laughs> People need to know. So is there any any final words you want to leave our listeners with tonight? You know, I, as we were talking, I realized, you know, so often when we are going through a divorce or any life transition, we keep trying to aim for perfection. I have to do this perfectly. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be perfect because we're going to end up human. And that's all we can strive for is to stay human. Uh, and I think that's, you know, what I love about our conversation is just the connection around how important it is for us just to be in that space with one another. So thank you so much, Leanne. This was, I really enjoyed talking with you tonight. Oh, thank you very much. I absolutely love the conversation and, and I can't wait to see what else you do and all of the awesome things that happen in the world of teenagers and we will definitely stay in touch thank you so very much mm, thank you